But then you look at the the innovation and technology that they spread throughout the world, the types of government, you know, kind of kind of that structure behind them. And I think that really did benefit a lot of countries around the world. Yes, maybe some countries are worse off because of it, but I think many of them kind of got that base to kind of build. I mean, like, look at the U.S. Hello and welcome back. Today I'm going to be watching and reacting to a 10 minute history, 10 minutes of the late British Empire. Short documentary. It's an animated little series that they're going on. And the, I just finished watching and reacting to the first part of this, the early British Empire and kind of how it came about, which I learned more things like, for example, I didn't know that Scotland, Scotland at the time invaded and took over Panama. Panama, like Panama Canal Panama. And then they, of course they got blockaded by the Spanish. England wouldn't help or Britain at the time would not help because they didn't want to spark a huge war over Scotland going for something and Panama and, and taking claim to the Spanish territory at the time. So that's just something that was in the previous video if you haven't watched that. Very good. And now we are moving on to the second one, part two. I guess it's not really a part two. I guess it is a part two, the late British Empire. So this is going to start in 1783, as you can tell, and let's just jump into this and learn more tidbits, learn more things that we never knew about. And game time. 1783, and the Americans have left. The empire, led by King George III, famous for being crazy, now had to find a new place for a penal colony, and it found one in Australia. So real quick, I know I just started the video, but King George III, wasn't he only crazy the last you know 10 years of his rule but before that he was i don't know if you would, you would say good but he was fine i just did my own little reading about this and i feel like that's in the back of my mind I had dementia or something like that in his last couple of years or last 10 years of rule which is a long time especially if you're the king so i'd understand you know 10 years worth of someone kind of going out of their mind that's the king you'll always be remembered for that but i don't know maybe it is just the case that he was Crazy, he was out of his mind during the whole thing, but I don't think so, let me know about that. But both Australia and New Zealand had been known to Europeans for centuries because of past Dutch explorers. It was Captain James Cook who sailed to both and claimed them for Britain. Mm -hmm. New South Wales was chosen as Britain's new penal colony and the first convicts arrived in 1788. So in the next year, the French Revolution happened, paving the way for the Napoleonic Wars, which were a British mm -hmm. victory. Victory here gave Britain a few new colonies, such as Malta and South Africa. Importantly, it also weakened Britain's great imperial rival, meaning it could increase the size of its empire without much resistance, which it did. The century following the Napoleonic Wars yes. is known as the Pax Britannica, the British peace, in which Britain was the world's sole superpower. Over the next few decades, there Britain, which Ireland had formerly been incorporated into, seized Guyana, Singapore, Assam, and this territory in India. Britain was helped in these ventures by the East India Company, who oversaw Britain's trade with China, mostly in opium. China had previously banned opium, but Britain refused to listen and kept importing it anyway because money. In 1839, the imperial Chinese government seized opium from British ships and destroyed it, which led to armed conflict, which Britain won, gaining lots of money, a continuation of opium selling in Hong Kong. Britain's victory here also gave it huge influence over China's economy, bringing- So that's where Hong Kong came from. This little conflict, not little, any conflict is big. This big conflict into what is known as the Informal Empire. The Informal Empire consisted of places which weren't directly under British control, but due to military and diplomatic pressure were often coerced into acting in Britain's interests. To the northwest of India, Britain turned its eyes to Afghanistan. On the surface, this was for trade, but the major reason was Russia. Britain was afraid that Russia would seize either Afghanistan or Persia, from which it could then invade India. Britain was also worried that Afghanistan would make an alliance with Russia and so invaded. This was a complete disaster and amounted to nothing more than a slaughter of British and Indian troops by the Afghan militias. This competition for influence between Britain and Russia is known as the Great Game and spread beyond Asia and into Europe. The Russians were increasing their influence in the Balkans and Britain was worried about Russian dominance there as well. In order to curb Russia, Britain, France and the Ottoman Empire began the Crimean War, which was a victory for the Allies and slowed the growing Russian power. I don't know exactly what year this is. I saw it in the beginning, but I don't know how, how the timeline's going. But the whole Afghanistan, you know, loss of life, British life there, wasn't that during Queen Victoria's and Albert's, uh, but Queen Victoria's reign? That's kind of where that happened. All of these different historical timelines are just like kind of weaving in and out of this. It's very, you know, complex. You could break this up into tens of thousands of different ways and, and histories and people and what happened there and why. But that's just kind of like 
connecting a few of those. In North America, Canada was established as a province and the borders between itself and the US were finalised. Canada later gained autonomy by becoming a dominion, which meant that the colony was self-governing but foreign policy was left to Britain. Also about this time, the British began to settle New Zealand. At first, the Maori, the natives of New Zealand, were fine with the Europeans as they brought trade to them, but eventually it dawned on them that the Europeans weren't going to stop coming. This led to war, which the British won, leading to more European settlement. In contrast to populating New Zealand, Ireland faced one of the greatest depopulations in human history thanks to the potato famine, which decimated potato mm -hmm. harvest. Which, an interesting thing that I never knew until a couple months ago about the Irish potato famine, is that Ireland's population, I forget what it was, it was something like 9 million people when the potato famine hit, and then it got cut so heavily, and now they're still, to this day, nowhere near the population of Ireland, what the population of Ireland was before the po Irish potato famine. In fact, let's just quickly look it up of Ireland before the potato famine. As a direct consequence of the famine, Ireland's population fell from almost 8.4 million in 1844 to 6.6 .6 million in 1851. About 1 million people died and perhaps 2 million more eventually immigrated to or from the country. So this is Britannica. So if you believe these stats on this website, that is, uh, and I, I've, I've heard similar, very close, you know, estimates as well. Seems, seems good with me. Dating from 1845 to 1849. Yeah, this is definitely during Victoria, Queen of Victoria and Albert who I love learning about. And now the population is of Ireland is 4.904 million. So that just shows like how, how much it just dove by. 8.4 million in 1844. And all these years later, nine point or 4.9. That's just crazy to me. That is, it's just so much time went by and it's still, you know, almost cut in half of what it used to be. These are the things that I get distracted by when I start looking things up about geography or history. I just go on this endless loop, this black hole of trying to find more and more things, more questions pop up and I'm, I'm just diving into it. Let's get back to the video before I spiral way too out of control with that. Here we go. The British forced the Irish to grow cash crops, which meant that there was less space to grow food there. The Irish grew potatoes since they had such a high caloric yield for the space they took up. When the famine struck, it was made worse by the British government, who ordered that food would still be exported from Ireland to Britain and that aid would be limited. Ireland's population dropped by half and still has yet to recover to its pre-1800 levels. There All the way back in India, Britain, specifically the independent East India Company, was having some trouble. So background. The East India Company's military was mostly staffed by sepoys, who were Indian troops who served under British officers. Hmm. These sepoys became increasingly unhappy as their treatment worsened. Their pay stagnated and they were also forced to fight abroad despite British promises that they wouldn't have to. British policy in India had also led to massive changes in its society as well, which upset many of those living there. For example, the British levied heavy taxes and did nothing to protect the Indian textile industry. The British were also arbitrarily grabbing more and more territory, which understandably made some Indian rulers nervous. Furthermore, the British were also keen proselytizers and many Hindus and Muslims felt that the British wanted to convert all of India to Christianity. None of this endeared the British to the Indians and in 1857 the Sepoys revolted against the East India Company. One Sepoy called Mangal Pandey mutinied against the British by assaulting some officers and his execution made him a martyr. The earlier British defeat in Afghanistan also gave confidence to the Indians since it meant that the British could be defeated. The actual rebellion began when Indian troops were issued with ammunition coated in either pig or beef fat which offended both the Muslim and Hindu Sepoys. When they refused to use the ammunition, the British arrested them and they, alongside others, mutinied. The rebelling sepoys seized some cities, including Delhi, but eventually the British were able to defeat them. The reasons for this were that only a few Indian states actually joined the rebellion. Many were neutral and support for the British oh. remained strong. One reason for this was that the concept of being Indian didn't really exist. India is an exceptionally diverse place and a Muslim from Bengal or a Sikh from Punjab had little in common with a Hindu from Delhi. Another reason for that the rebellion's sense. failure was that it was not a pre-planned, politically backed uprising and the British had much better organisation. The cost incurred in money, prestige and lives led the British Crown to take control of the running of India and the East India Company was dissolved in 1858 and Queen Victoria was proclaimed the Empress of India. The British also gained more land from the Indians, removing disloyal chiefs called Nawabs from power. What's that little tiny dot right here? Why did they not own this tiny little dot? You would think they would. Because I've seen this in other pictures before. I'm like, why not just take that tiny little spot? 
or what? I don't know. Britain's dominance over its colonies was secured by increasing technological advancements brought about by the Industrial Revolution. Some of the most important of these advancements were the steam-powered ship, trains, the telegram and more advanced firearms. This dominance wouldn't last forever and towards the end of the century Britain found itself with new rivals. These were the United States which was recovering from its civil war, the newly unified German Empire and a rising Japan which was looking to carve up Asia. The new German Empire wanted colonies of its own and so turned to Africa. This worried the British and in order to soothe tensions the Berlin Conference was called to divide up Africa in a way that avoided war. So Africa went from looking like this to this, with Britain and France getting yes. the lion's share. So the British public's response to Crazy. imperialism was mixed. Outright opposition to colonialism was very rare. Most people's attitudes sat between apathy and a deep pride in Britain's role as a colonial power. This was primarily due to the belief that Britain was a civilising force. So Britain's conquest of Africa was not a simple and straightforward affair. Britain had substantial military advantages over the Africans it was conquering, such as rifles, machine guns and gunboats. Mm -hmm. Yet many Africans were able to win victories against the British, such as the Zulus, who slaughtered the British at the Battle of Isandalwana. On the same day, the British won one of its best known battles, the Battle of Rourke's Drift. Another group of Africans... I think there's a movie about that, or one of those. I, I like the movie a lot. I don't know, once again, how historically accurate it is, but it was a very entertaining movie. I don't know when it was from the 50s or something like that 60s i'm not i'm not sure but good movie good movie and the boers who were originally dutch settlers also resisted british expansion in south africa in order to defeat boer guerrilla warfare by denying them shelter the british placed many women and children into concentration camps where they faced horrible conditions the conquest of africa was short and was pretty much complete after 30 years with only ethiopia and liberia remaining independent the southern colonies in Africa were unified into South Africa, which alongside Australia and New Zealand became a dominion, just like Canada. The empire grew to its territorial height after the First World War, where Britain gained sizeable Ottoman and German territory. Yep, we did a whole video on this as well, and that was crazy to watch. That was very fun to watch, but yes, this is the height of their empire. It wasn't all gains for Britain though, as throughout the war, Britain's hold on Ireland became untenable, and Ireland became an independent republic in 1922. From the crumbling Ottoman Empire, the British gained Palestine, which it was decided would become a home for the world's Jewish people. Hundreds of thousands of Jews arrived in Palestine over the next couple of decades, and their increasing numbers and political powers there caused several revolts against the British, all of which were suppressed. After the Second World War, many more arrived, and the tensions rose again, culminating in a civil war and the creation of Israel. So, the Second World War was a British victory, but had brought Britain to the brink of economic ruin. Indians had been seeking independence from Britain since about five minutes after it turned up. Many Indians felt that their contribution to both world wars meant that they were owed independence. In 1937, India held elections in which the Indian National Congress, an advocate for independence, won the largest share of the seeds. Furthermore, the famine of 1943, which was caused mostly by Britain diverting food away from India, had cost the lives of many millions, increasing demands for the end of British rule. The most famous opponents to the British were Mohandas Gandhi and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Gandhi was not a politician, but was very important since he practiced a non-violent approach. Good movies about Gandhi as well. I really liked learning about him. Just a question for anyone in Britain. What are the views, what are the views of India to you guys today and vice versa? Like, how do you guys view India and how does India view you? It's kind of like along the same lines as, you know, what does Vietnam think of the US and what do we think of Vietnam? I want to know what your thoughts are about India. Maybe you guys are the great, you know, friends now, or maybe it's just kind of sour still. These are the things that I just kind of, you don't know unless you live there. Jinnah is famous for advocating that India be divided so that Muslims could have their own state as well. In 1947, India gained its independence and was subsequently divided into India and Pakistan. Britain was unable to fight this tie due to its weakness. It simply couldn't afford to force India to stay. Yeah, no way. Furthermore, Clement At Attlee, Britain's post-war prime minister, was sympathetic to the Indian cause. The division of India was not so peaceful, though, and it is believed that during the mass migration, ethnic cleansing and fighting that occurred afterwards, as many as two million people died. Mm. In the aftermath of World War II, Britain found itself opposed by two anti-imperialist superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Slowly but surely, go. over the course of the 20th century, colonies broke away from British rule, some violently, some peacefully. A notable example of British imperial retreat is Kenya. Kenya had been run similarly to most other colonies, with white settlers owning lots of land, amassing wealth and forcing horrible working conditions on the natives. Many Kenyans, notably Jomo Kenyatta, attempted to get reforms from the British, all of which were refused. Some Kenyans then turned to violence, and what is known as the Mau Mau Uprising began. 
The Mau Mau resorted to guerrilla warfare, but the British were able to suppress the uprising after capturing its leaders. Both sides committed horrendous war crimes, including torture and the murder of women and children. In 1960, Britain announced that it would move towards an independent Kenya, and in 1963, Kenya gained its independence with Kenyatta as its first president. Britain's motives for this were simple, the writing was on the wall and the empire was going to end. Harold Macmillan, the Prime Minister of Britain, made sure that the handover of power was swift to help promote good relations between Britain and its former colonies. Decolonisation would continue for the next several decades until Britain's last major colony, Hong Kong, was handed back to China in mm -hmm. 1997, thus marking the end of the empire. So in conclusion, the legacy of the British Empire is undeniable. One only needs to look at a map of countries that drive on the left, play cricket or rugby, or still have the British monarch as their head of state. Opinions on the empire range from it being a civilising force to an oppressive one. What can be said for definite is that without the empire, the world would have looked very different today. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for That's watching. That's very true. And I think a lot of times, of course, with any country conquering and taking over peacefully or not peacefully, there's going to be ugly parts and there's going to be beautiful parts of, of any anything like this. Like, for one, you know, you saw kind of the war crimes that happened here, but then you look at the, the innovation and technology that they spread throughout the world, the types of government, you know, kind of kind of that structure behind them. And I think that really did benefit a lot of countries around the world. Yes, maybe some countries are worse off because of it, but I think many of them kind of got that base to kind of build. I mean, like, look at the US, it's Canada, Australia, New Zealand, a lot of places. I don't know how South Africa is, but maybe South Africa. A lot of these have that underlying kind of foundation, perhaps helped maybe greatly by the British. And then other countries, yeah, might, might not be well off. I just am not knowledgeable enough on this, but they for sure added a lot of benefits to places around the world. And like they said for India, they added railroads uh, across, you know, spider webbing across their country, which really pushed that forward. And I'm sure after Britain was out, they really heavily benefited off of that and learned from it and built more. You know, it's just gonna kind of help develop a lot of countries around the world. So just, just the thought that I have. We'll get in discussions in the comments, chat about it, add a few questions. We'll talk about what, what your relations are with India now, what you think you gave the world, stuff like that, you know, anything. I want to hear it, I'll read them, try to get in a discussion, we'll go from there. So until next time, thanks for joining, thanks for watching, thanks for making it this far, and have a fantastic, yes, fantastic rest of your day.